Good morning and welcome to the Pendleton Presbyterian Church service of worship on this August the 16th. We're delighted to have those who are in the congregation with us this morning, as well as those who may be in our parking lot and those who join us by Facebook and then later by uh, YouTube. We hope that you will receive a blessing. You have the prayer of confession in your bulletins, and by the way, about these bulletins, we are redoing re, uh, our church computer, and it did not get completed, and so that's why you have a, a sheet this morning and not the regular bulletin. Hopefully we'll be back on tune next week. Would you please rise if you're able? And let us pray together. You are the light of the world, O Christ, yet we do not reflect that light. You have called us salt, but our lives are bland and inspire no one. You give wisdom and the means for discerning your will, yet we are aimless and prisoners of the whims of others. Forgive our lackluster performance as actors in your drama of salvation. Set us right and renew us by your Spirit. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the Word is life, and the life is our light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Know that to all who receive Christ, who believe in his name, power is given to become children of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. This morning we have received our tithes and gifts in the lock boxes that are in each vestibule. Let us thank God for the ministry that they present before us. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for this day that you have given us to live within. And we pray that our offerings would be in service to the kingdom of Christ and that your spirit would direct our will as we use them for your good. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, and I shall read to you the 124th Psalm. Hear the word of God. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when our enemies attacked us, they would have swallowed us up alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us up as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken. We have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. 
And now with these words in our hearts and upon our minds, let us come before God in prayer, confident that God hears our prayers, beginning in a moment of silence while you offer the prayers that you have brought with you. Let us pray. And now let us join together in prayer. Our loving God, we are grateful for our lives, for this day, for the joy of our blessings. We give you praise for our privileges. We cannot think of our lives without thinking of those whose problems are greater than ours. You, O oh God, are our hope. May those for whom we now pray find their hope in you also. We pray for those who wander, drifting aimlessly, seeking what they cannot find, finding what they do not need, using what uses them and not caring. Bring them to repentance and faith. We pray for those who live in the past, finding the present unsuitable, looking for times that never were, building a future that can never be, bring them to themselves. We pray for those who are lonely and ache inside, mourning the loss of a loved one, open them to others. We pray for those who run from responsibility, preferring childishness to maturity, mocking the moral or trying relationships and credibility to the fool. Show them, we pray, reality. Oh, holy God, lift all this day who in any way need your redeeming power and seal their salvation in the Savior through the Spirit of God that watches us all. In the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit, we offer the prayer that Christ gave unto us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And our reading this morning from the New Testament is taken from the book of Jeremiah. And I shall read to you from the 31st chapter, verses 31 through 34, as you hear again the word of God, where Jeremiah is speaking about God's new covenant. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And we pray in the strength and power of our risen Christ that our understanding might be added. Amen. In all of the Old Testament, there are perhaps no more words greatly beloved more movingly profound than this, what I read to you a moment ago. 
how here is shined upon Israel and upon all of the world a bright ray of hope. It is no less than the promise that when history's play is ended and its joys and tragedies done, it is God and God's righteousness that will triumph. Down there sometime, God will redeem his people and make them good and establish them with this new covenant of peace. Such is the hope all more moving because it was spoken at a time of great despair when it appeared that hope was impossible. The year is 587 BC. That was a year when the little kingdom of Judah finally learned a hard and tragic lesson. Judah had dared once too often the might of the Babylonian Empire and had paid for it with its national life. Nebuchadnezzar's army had swept down, done its work. The walls were battered, the city was a smoking ruin. The small army that had been its pride now lay dead on the battlefields. Dreary ranks of captives were lined up, readied for the long march away. It was the end of a nation. It would no longer rise against anyone that mattered for a long, long time. It was very nearly the end of their hope. You see, religion had always told them that what had just happened could not happen. God would not allow it. This was his people, his city, his holy abode. Here was David's eternal throne. He would never allow this city to be taken, but would, on the contrary, one day glorify it as the center of his earthly dominion and his triumphant dominion. And now that hope is finished, shown for the lie that it was. And what is more, the speaker of these words is the prophet of doom, or the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, who was a melancholy doom crier, who in a lifelong time had scarcely offered any hope to anyone at all. All his life he had been shattered by the fool's hope, by their paganism, and by their unbrotherly greed, the people have broken God's covenant with them and lost all of their claim for God's mercy. Now, it had happened. The axe had fallen. And what word will this most hopeless of men have to say to the future that seems only filled with despair? He said, Behold, the days are coming when I will make with you a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Out yonder, somewhere, under God, there is hope. Now, that is moving. But is it relevant? It was spoken in the year 587 B.C. What has that possibly got to do with you and me who are Christian, what has it possibly to do with us who are living in the grace of the year by God 2020? That Jeremiah, Jeremiah's word was relevant to them, that is obvious. It was no less than the promise that they would on some day have a new beginning as a new people. But that is a word to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. And you and I are neither. Their faith was a noble faith, and we are heir to a part of it. But it is not precisely our faith. We had no part in that little bit of ancient history. However, let's understand this. Theologically speaking, B.C. is not a period of time that ended with the birth of Christ. 
rather BC is a condition of living. Whoever is not subject to the Lordship of Christ, BC still remains for that person. Christ has not yet come, so our world, by definition, is largely a BC world. Our country, in spite of the many churches, is deeply in BC. Moreover, BC continues in the church and in each one of us. For whenever there is an attitude or an action contrary to the rule of Christ, there is the old Adam before Christ. If Jeremiah speaks to BC men and women, he addresses you and he addresses me also for what we are profoundly are. Our hopes, like those of Jeremiah, combated, have been the hopes of all BC peoples. And that is for a cozy little world where danger does not threaten us or at least it's kept far away, for prosperity and security and plenty of items for everyone, at least for ourselves. And we look to God to make good our hopes, for are we not good Christian people? If you are snug in a cozy little world of your own, content with it, never looking beyond it, then Jeremiah cannot get through to you. If you are quite confident that the world will one day work out its own troubles through science, education, and moral instruction, you have your nice little world, and you will listen to no other. If you cannot believe that a just God will let it happen here, then you indeed live in a secure world that Jeremiah cannot penetrate. But who can live in such a closed world anymore? The rubble of our world is all about us, and we see it today in unrest and unconscionable violence toward each other of unthinkable sins against humankind that are largely unnecessary. Hear the words of Jeremiah who said, after all of this, what I just mentioned, I looked around, the earth was barren and had no form. The sun, moon, and stars had disappeared. The mountains were shaken. No people could be seen. All the birds had flown away. Farmland had become a desert and towns were in ruins. The Lord's fierce anger had done all of this. And I wish that my eyes were fountains of tears so that I could cry day and night for my people who were killed. We have to soberly face the fact that God is not necessarily committed to our protection. God is not bound to give us our hopes and all of the things that we realize we should have in life. God will not grant us peace on our own terms. And it is when at last we know this that our ears come open to Jeremiah's words. And he says, you will still have hope, but you will put your hope now in the right place. You will hope in God and his new covenant of grace, for false hope is now gone. To be sure, we sense that Jeremiah is speaking of our true hope. Perhaps modern folk that we are, we would not describe ourselves in this way, we would prefer some more tangible program and something far less theological. But who can gaze upon this picture of God's redeemed, righteous society without sensing that he or she is looking through a window and into hope? 
Jeremiah is speaking of a covenant. And a covenant is within a community under law. And we know that if there is any hope for this world, it lies in the direction of some community of humans under a just and universally accepted law. But is there hope for such a thing? Perhaps it lies beyond all of our possibilities, beyond our political possibilities. No reform could produce such redeemed society, yet we too have continually hoped for a righteous world order around some turning, some program of military or political action. And what a pocket of bogus messiahs this BC world has followed in search of it. Fascist messiahs, cynical communist messiahs, well-dressed capitalist messiahs, all who would make us one world under their image. A thousand well intentioned programs, no doubt, they're worthy even necessary, but there's no real hope in any of them. If we want to know anything about hope for humankind, in this year of our Lord 2020, it lies beyond the possibilities of ourselves, beyond our religious possibilities also. Now that is even a harder lesson to learn, and Neither we nor the ancient Jew wanted to learn it. So BC folk are frustrated by Jeremiah's word. To many it seems to be a cruel delusion. Call it hope if you like. A beautiful dream, but no hope will ever come of it in this, the real world. What is the point in hoping for something you can never get? So the attitude that many adopt is, well, settle for what you can get. Shall I tell you a secret? Even those who come to church to pray for the fulfillment of the promise, they often have very little hope. We are looking ahead to some great redemptive revolution saying, thy kingdom come, looking about us and seeing no sign that it is coming, cringing in fear, hoping at most to survive. BC men and women that we are, our cry goes up. When will you act, O God, to bring salvation, to bring righteousness? And hidden unbelief responds Will such a thing ever be? So we must go beyond Jeremiah's words and beyond B.C. We must follow Jeremiah's word ahead to the gospel. For it is to the gospel that it points and drives us. And until it has driven us there, then Jeremiah's words have not served their purpose. We hear his words, I will make with you a new covenant. That is the promise. We also hear the gospel words, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. And that is fulfillment. With that, we are called out of our BC and into the AD. We are told that our frantic questions when will these things be? When will God act to fulfill his promises and bring hope to pass? Now, my friends, these are not Christian questions. When will God act? God has acted. The promise has been fulfilled. The time has come. The society of the new covenant has been formed and the age of hope is right now. The trouble is that it did not come as BC folk expected, and so they could not see it. 
That's exactly why the old Jews could not accept Christ. They expected the coming of a messianic age that would be a revolution, and therefore they could see no hope in Jesus. Nor did Jesus bring hope to pass as we had wanted it done earlier in our own lives. He made his new covenant. He suffered and he died. But Caesar stayed on the throne. No reign of righteousness began. His law is not yet upon every heart. Nor did Jesus bring to pass anything, it seems, that we wanted done either. He made his new covenant. He died. His law is not yet on every heart. What hope is there of the fulfillment of our dreams and our hopes? And yet, I believe the gospel is the very beginning ordering of hope. Born, as it were, on the air of Easter morning, there rang out the glad good news. It has happened. He has come. He died. He has risen again. And the promised new age, it is here. You could not bring it in, but it has come. All history since Adam has been reversed in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And he says to you and me and all to step over that line of B.C. and A.D., accept his rule and live as citizens of his kingdom. And this Christ, who fulfilled the law of the prophets and all of the hope of Israel, has given to his people the promised new covenant. From the beginning, he said to people, follow me. They were no great people. God knows. And he set before them no penance. He set before them no rules of discipline, no rules to be pious. Rather, they heard his summons, receive my grace and be my disciples. Obey me and do the work that I have done. Live as I have lived. Receive my grace. Only one question did he place before them? Who do you say? You say that I am. There is no theological quibbling here. Only the heart of the matter. Am I your Lord? Then obey me. Am I your Messiah? Then trust me. And it was to those who received this grace that he gave the bread and the wine on that evening of the sacramental meal of the covenant spread before the 12 elders who were the representatives of the new Israel. And as they tasted the elements, they symbolically accepted what he did, entering into his death and sharing and rising to newness of life. They also accepted his rule and admitted its victory that you do so forth the Lord's death until he returns. Here, I think, my friends, Jeremiah's words find fulfillment. In the church, the redeemed society, the society of new hope, Christ has already won that victory and into that victorious, though yet unfinished, the Christian, you and me, have entered. The Christian fearing neither life nor death, nor time, nor eternity, participating in a life eternal in the midst of time. And we too are appointed by Jeremiah's words beyond our B.C. despair and false hope to Christ, who is the fulfillment of the hope that has been given to us in him. And we are reminded of our high privilege of living in God's grace and new age as covenant people. 
Now, I grant you this is not the way of thinking for B.C. and A.D. people of promise and fulfillment and the struggle of two ages is strange to our way of thinking. And yet, as a Christian, you must always see yourself as a participant in this revolutionary struggle. The world of B.C. still lives. It continues. It is the world spread upon the pages of the morning news. And this is the world we despair of. There is no hope in it. But in this world is another. And it is at war with this world, the kingdom of Christ. And it is a strangely weak kingdom. No airplanes, no bombs, but an unbelievably strong kingdom that commands the minds and the consciousness of men and women, calling them, calling us to loyalty. There is no hope in this world, but remember, there is another world that is at war with the world in which we live, trying desperately to open it to the message of Christ. And this new age, it has come upon us through the grace of God, and it is the foundation of our hope. So let us say it frankly, the Christian gospel does not offer us our hopes. It gives us no technique for managing God in order to get what we would like to have. It provides no program for converting the world to our way of thinking so that my interest and yours may be secured. These are our hopes, and the gospel knows nothing of our hopes. Rather, it summons us to a place of our hope in what Christ has done and trust in his ultimate victory. That is our affirmation of faith. That is our hope. That the turning of history, it is not out there somewhere, but it has already happened. God's rule in Jesus Christ will not be defeated. The Christ who stood in the beginning with God and by whom all things are made, is also standing with God at the end of history in victory. This is our hope for the future, that God's new age is already among us and victorious. And in that spirit, we celebrate life together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And now, my friends, would you please rise with me and, and say the Apostles' Creed. And let us repeat our belief. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> The hymn is number 125, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
And now to him who is able to keep you and present you faultless, even before the throne of Almighty God, our Lord Jesus Christ, go in his peace, serve one another, bless one another in his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.